Capitalism and Disability by Marta Russell. Chapter 11, Targeting Disability. In addition to old age benefits, it is often forgotten that Social Security provides survivor and disability insurance protections as well. The Bush administration instigated Social Security privatization debate has overlooked the fact of SSDI as a part of the program's family, be family of benefits. I'll wager that most Americans are unaware of the importance of SSDI, especially young workers who are the target of Bush's campaign to divert funds into private stock market accounts. I, too, was unaware until the late 1980s, when I found myself unable to work, with an eight-year-old child to support. I had worked to put myself through college and made a career in the film industry. Even though I was born with cerebral palsy, it never occurred to me that someday I might not be able to continue to work due to complications from my impairment. According to the Social Security Administration, three in 10 Americans have a chance of becoming impaired before reaching age 67, able-bodied or not. I have been paying into SSDI, which today amounts to about one percentage point of the 6.2% total payroll tax deducted from one's salary, and had worked sufficiently long so that when faced with a bodily breakdown, I could apply for disability benefits. Disability is placed in the same framework established for the old age program. Like retirement, SSDI is a wage earner, social insurance. It is, calculated <coughs> it is calculated based on wages earned over the number of years worked. It is not a personal investment account. If one becomes unable to engage in substantial gainful activity due to impairment, SSDI is there to furnish income in place of wages, as opposed to a 401k, for instance. SSDI won't be there in any meaningful form, however, if President Bush dupes the public into believing that Social Security is in crisis. It is about to become bankrupt, and the solution is an, over or is an ownership society that promotes privatization, a proposal that could siphon a larger portion of the payroll tax revenue out of the retirement fund into private investment accounts. The Bush administration could deliver a blow to the Disability Insurance Trust Fund, a separate account in the United States Treasury, just as it plans for the Retirement Fund. The President's Committee to Strengthen Social Security report, titled Strengthening Social, Social Security and Creating Personal Wealth for All Americans, states that SSDI program outlays are projected to increase as a percent of payroll by 45% over the next 15 years and SSDI's cost will exceed its tax revenue starting in 2009. In other words, the committee's view is that the disability fund is in crisis, as is the retirement fund. Despite Bush's sales pitch assurances that benefits will not be cut, a leaked private White House memo to conservative allies strongly argues that Social Security benefits paid to future retirees must be significantly reduced to make the plan work. The committee's blueprint, in fact, cuts disability benefits along with retiree benefits to help pay for the cost of private accounts. The projected $2 trillion shortfall over the first decade alone resulting from the carve-outs from payroll tax revenue to pay for private accounts must either be paid for by cutting benefits or added on to the record deficit if current benefits continue to be paid. In Bush White House doublespeak, the committee's report cautioned that the disability benefit reductions shouldn't be viewed as a recommendation, but said in the absence of, in the absence of fully developed proposals, the calculations carried out for the commission and included in this report assume that defined benefits will be changed in similar ways for the two programs. If the disability insurance elements of the program were insulated from benefit cuts, then much larger cuts in retirement benefits would be necessary to achieve the same overall level of cost reductions. Reductions which are necessary because of the loss of the trust fund's revenue 
to the individual accounts. The sums are not insignificant. Already benefits to future retirees could be slashed by as much as 40%, according to the Centre on Budget and Policy Priorities, one Bush plan being tossed around to save Social Security. Price indexing would result in a 46% drop in Social Security benefits for the average worker who retired in 2075 as compared to current law. Currently, retirement benefits are matched to changing wage levels, but tying Social Security to an inflation index could significantly cut retirement benefits for all working Americans, since inflation usually grows at a slower rate than money wages. That is, real wages tend to rise over time. SSDI is run like the retirement program, so it is likely that it could, it, that it, that it too could be switched to an inflation index, lowering the already meager disability benefits to levels one cannot survive on. In December 2004, for instance, the average disability benefit was a chintzy $894 per month. <clears throat> There are more ways SSDI regulations could be manipulated to cut benefits and dismantle the system. The Bush administration could make eligibility rules more restrictive by changing the definition of disabled or make formula changes that reduce benefits. It could use continuing disability reviews, SD or CDRs, which determine whether a disabled person can work to purge disabled people from the rules increase the number of work credits required to qualify, and eliminate the annual cost of living adjustments. Already, SSDI can be extremely difficult to obtain owing to denials and the need to appeal one's claim. Too often, lawyers must be hired to do battle with the Social Security Administration. The process is rife with undue stress and economic hardship. Some applicants are made to wait one to two years for a final determination. Bush's ownership society does not apply to them. After these applicants lose their jobs and while they wait for SSDI, the former workers' homes are often foreclosed on and they lose their cars and savings. Many become homeless and live on the streets due to eligibility process laws and delays. It is a degrading adversarial Adversar adversarial process. Some cannot deal with the fear of falling financially and commit suicide. All these chronically ill persons must wait two years to be covered by Medicare. As Linda, F as Linda Fullerton of the Social Security Disability Coalition explained in her congressional testimony, September 30th, 2004, the current SSD process seems to be structured in a way to be as difficult as possible in order to suck the life out of applicants in hope that they give up or die in the process so that Social Security doesn't have to pay them their benefits. It is well known that in 1981, President Reagan proposed cutting retirement benefits to shore up the retirement fund. Less no <coughs> Sorry. Less known is that the Reaganites, hoping to save billions of dollars, arbitrarily sent tens of thousands of disabled people <coughs> CDR notices that they were no longer disabled and cut off their benefits entirely. This paper crackdown on eligibility without due process resulted in extreme hardship and in many instances, death, sometimes by suicide since the disability check was the only source of income for impaired people who could not work. The government has done nothing to compensate the victims of its deliberate negligence. It was as if the people whose benefits had been cut off had simply been deemed disposable. When legal aid attorneys sought an injunction against the head of the Social Security Administration, a judge in California stopped the Regan savagery. In a double whammy to the SSDI program, according to the minority staff of the House Ways and Means Committee, President Bush's committee also recommended that access to disability accounts prior to retirement age be barred. This means not only reduced Social Security benefits, 
but also no money from the accounts to cushion the loss. Such a change would defeat the purpose of SSDI entirely. <clears throat> the hard right conservatives might say that the market through private disability insurance can pick up the pieces, but there's no private insurance plan that can compete with a social insurance program such as SSDI and covering disabled workers. For a 27 year old worker with a spouse and two children, for instance, Social Security provides the equivalent of a $353,000 disability insurance policy. The vast majority of workers would be unable to obtain similar coverage through private markets. According to the General Accounting Office, GAO, in 1996, only 26% of private sector employees had long-term disability coverage under employer-sponsored insurance plans. Work-related coverage has been shrinking, not expanding since then. It is not unheard of that after 40 years of paying into private disability insurance, the insurer refuses to recognize impairment as incapacitating and denies a claim. Last November, for instance, Unum Provident reached a tentative settlement with the insurance regulators of several states, which required Unum Provident or Provident and its subsidiaries to reconsider more than 200,000 long-term disability claims, which had been terminated or denied from January 1st, 1997 to the present. The regulators levied a $15 million fine and instructed the insurer to review its claim handling pro uh, practices. Investigations focused on assertions that Unum Provident had improperly denied claims for benefits under individual and group long-term disability insurance policies. <clears throat> they concluded that Unum Provident had committed numerous violations of its obligation to fairly administer claims. How about the prospect that private investment accounts could replace lost SSDI benefits? In January 2001, after examining a number of privatization plans, the GAO concluded the income from workers' individual accounts was not sufficient to compensate for the decline in the insurance benefits that disabled beneficiaries would receive. This is in part because balances would accumulate over much shorter periods of time than retirement accounts and would therefore provide much less income in the event that a worker becomes disabled. Indeed, it is illusory to believe that the majority of able-bodied or working disabled persons fit the profile of a worker with a lifetime of continuous work and thus enough gains to build savings accounts. Current labor market realities make staying employed a significant challenge, with workers being forced into many different jobs with long intervals of unemployment. At the end of 2004, 6,198,000 persons depended on SSDI. Disabled workers and their family members together com comprise almost 8 million on the program. The Disability Insurance Trust Fund was created with passage of the Social Security Amendments of 1956 in large measure due to efforts by organized labor. The AFL and CIO to protect workers as capitalists used up workers' bodies and cast them aside. Business, especially the insurance industry, was dead set against it. Today, business is amongst the biggest supporters of privatization. The Business Roundtable, a group of blue-chip U.S. companies including Coca-Cola, ExxonMobil, and IBM, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Federation of Independent Business, the National Restaurant Association, and the National Association of Manufacturers, all contend that individual accounts will stave off a payroll tax hike in the future, and they are anteing up millions of dollars to buy Bush's revamping of the safety net. Some social analysts describe the disability benefits system as a privilege <clears throat> because it grants permission to be exempt from the work-based system. Conservatives used to describe the disability system as part of the moral economy. Neither privilege nor morality theories, however, adequately describe the function of the disability benefits system. This privileged or moral status does not grant disabled individuals any objective right to a decent standard of living. Retirees' benefits are higher overall than those of disabled persons on SSDI. Disability benefits hover at what is determined an official poverty level. 
For fiscal year 2004, the federal poverty guideline for one is $9,310. The average monthly benefit that a disabled worker receives from SSDI is $894. Average monthly benefits for disabled women are $274 lower than men's. Income is even less if one is disabled at the bottom of the social strata with no work history or not enough quarters of work to qualify for SSDI. This group of disabled persons must apply for the welfare needs-based disability program. Supplemental Security Income, SSI, where the average federal benefit is $417.20 per month. Imagine trying to live on that. Christ. The Conservatives plan to drain payroll tax revenue from the program through privatization is one way to make the little people pay for Bush's tax cuts for the rich. It will also enrich Wall Street with a guaranteed influx of new clients buying stocks and bonds with their social, with their social security money, a substantial boon for financial corporations. But it is no less an effort to make workers less secure by undermining the social commitments made with the passage of the Social Security Act in 1935 and the creation of Social Security Disability Insurance, already inadequate when it was instituted in 1956. Private accounts would undermine the guaranteed benefits that are the foundation of Social Security. The Bushites want it both ways, to super exploit the wor workforce and create a you're-on-your-own society that would deprive workers of the security and social compensation owed them. If the privatizers succeed, able-bodied and disabled workers will be made poorer. Under a privatized system, workers may only get out what they put in, unlike the current more progressive social security formula that provides guaranteed and proportionally higher benefits to lower earners. Investment accounts that rely upon a shifty stock market can rob workers of every penny saved. As of this writing, there is no final Bush proposal on the table. To squelch criticism and cool dissent, Bush has recently stated that he will not cut disability benefits, benefit checks, and perhaps he won't directly go after SSDI, not now at least, because the first goal is to start the process of dismantling Social Security by convincing Americans they will be better off with private investment accounts. Building a groundswell for undermining SSDI has been a long-term endeavor, however. Regan, for instance, aside from, from severing disabled persons from the rolls, tried to fold SSDI into a social service block grant to the states, which would have effectively eliminated the entitlement. In 1980, President Carter's Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare stated, Disability is killing us. As the Carter administration succeeded in putting a cap on disability benefits and changing the way benefits were calculated to, lo <clears throat> to lower payments. Over the years, hard right critics of SSDI have deemed it rife with fraud. Congresspersons have spoken of the dilemma of disability dependency and accused the program's growth of being out of control. One reason that Republicans supported the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990 was to provide protections against employment discrimination so that disabled persons would get off the dole and into jobs. The current Bush administration's approach is likely to be indirect by making changes to regulations. For instance, there is already a plan afloat to require that those on SSDI reapply every two years, an arduous task that some may not manage well, manage well resulting in their disqualification from the program. In addition, the success of social insurance depends upon the widest pooling of risk. If the privatizers succeed as money is diverted into private accounts, there will be less in the common pool of funds that comprise retirement and disability benefits. Disability payouts will then appear to be taking a larger piece of the pie, making the SSDI program an easy target for the hard right. Economics, however, is not the prime motive behind the push to privatize our public commonwealth. Bush has admitted that privatization will not make Social Security solvent. The reasons are political and ideological. The White House memo mentioned earlier stated, For the first time in six decades, the, so the Social Security battle is one we can win, 
and in doing so, we can help transform the political and philosophical landscape of the country. Hard right conservatives have been working since the New Deal's inception to kill off Roosevelt's vision. <clears throat> to kill off Roosevelt's vision, no matter that it has been a success story. In the early 1980s, free market conservatives such as the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation began to hammer out the, market, the free market manifestos that lay the groundwork for the current campaign. Now the Bush administration is forcing us to defend the social security system that conservatives despise so much, rather than fighting to improve it. It is an all-out assault. Newt Gingrich called one strategy, starve the beast, drive up the, de drive up the deficit, then use that as justification to cut the safety net. Privatization is the next step of a calculated long-term campaign to end social security. We must do all we can to see this doesn't happen to our children.